Hello everyone, my name is Bailey Brown. I'm a reporter with the Eagle newspaper. Today I have an exciting guest, uh, Dr. Roman Papaduke. Hi, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you? I'm fine, Bailey. Thank you very much for having me today. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I, we are so excited that you're able to join us and we're going to dive right into the reason you're here. Um, but for those viewers out there who, who may not know um, Dr. Roman Papaduke, um, he is the former first U.S. ambassador to uh, Ukraine. Um, thank you so much for, for your service in that capacity. Um, for those of you who also don't know, um, he's currently serving on the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council, and he currently serves as president of the Diplomacy Center Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what you do? Sure. The foundation is a private 501c3 nonprofit. We are in a public-private partnership with the U.S. State Department to build a Museum of American Diplomacy at the State Department. That's amazing. Okay. Um, you are also uh, a retired member of the Career Senior Foreign Service with more than 30 years of experience in the areas of national security, political risk analysis, communication strategy, and energy policy, including serving on the National Security Councils of Presidents Ronald Reagan and George Bush. Um, Dr. Papaduk also, for us locals here, uh, served for 13 years as the executive director of the George Bush Presidential Library Foundation at Texas A&M University. Um, he was also chairman of the executive committee of the China-U.S. Relations Conference at A&M. Um, also, you served as deputy assistant to the president and deputy press secretary for foreign affairs under President George H.W. Bush, a position you also held toward the end of President Ronald Reagan's administration. Um, along with serving on the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council, you're also a member of the Council of Foreign Relations. Is that correct? Wow. Extensive resume, plus more that we couldn't even get to. <laughs> but what brought you here today to, to visit with me um, is your efforts in human humanitarian aid to Ukraine, um, given all that's happened since the war started. Um, if you could tell me a little bit, what's kept you a part of this relationship to Ukraine, and how did it lead you to where you are currently? In, with helping through humanitarian aid? Uh, sure. Uh, just to give you a quick background, uh, obviously you mentioned I served as the first U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, but besides that, I'm also of Ukrainian background heritage, and so I grew up speaking Ukrainian wow. at home and, and uh, learning the language and the culture, so I have a tie to the country, and, uh, and we have um, a lot of my relatives are still in Ukraine, Western Ukraine. Wow. As a matter of fact, my goddaughter is visiting now uh, oh. and staying in College Station. She'll be leaving back for Ukraine next week with her son. So there is a personal tie to the country uh, in that sense. But outside of that, it's a great humanitarian tragedy that's uh, taking place in Ukraine. And uh, if you look at the numbers, for example, the last time I looked at it, it we were talking something like seven million people that were, uh, you know, fled the country because of the war that's going on. But at the same time, there are approximately seven million internally displaced people. So you're talking a population of about 14 million people that have been uprooted in one way or another. Uh, and that has created a huge humanitarian issue, both in terms of services for these individuals as well as health care for these individuals. Not to say, of course, the rest of the population also is suffering right. to a certain degree because right. of the conflicts ongoing. So because of my personal background, my relationship to the country through my former position, as well as the humanitarian crisis, I've gotten involved uh, in many ways to help you know, alleviate that humanitarian issue. And one of the ways I've gotten involved to help is uh, I've become a board member of Elevate Ukraine, which is a College Station-based uh, nonprofit oh, uh, aimed at helping yeah. Ukraine in its humanitarian uh, work. Wow, that's amazing. I, I, I completely forgot. I'm so glad you're a part of that, as you should be. You know all those all those ties. That's so that's so wonderful. And given, um, you know, the, the devastation that the country mm -hmm. has, has seen. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, what kind of aid do you provide? Um, who helps with that? And where is it most utilized? You know, a great question. Uh, the aid, uh, the, the individuals that started the organization, a lot of their early efforts, even pre-forming uh, the formation of Elevate Ukraine, was geared toward helping orphans and children, in particular in Western Ukraine, uh, in terms of giving them a experience of a different lifestyle. Uh, they facilitated uh, entry into camps and th things of that nature for them to give them a different vision of uh, lifestyles and to alleviate some of the hardships that the orphans um, um, may have been experiencing. 
they, pro uh, they progressed then into a greater humanitarian effort to provide all kinds of medical equipment, communications equipment, as well as uh, generators, for example, for electrical power. Mm -hmm. So all of that kind of grew on the basis of that. And I think one of the missions of Elevate Ukraine is not only to meet the current humanitarian efforts along the lines I've just mentioned, but also to try to build a solid foundation for Ukraine uh, for the future in the post-war environment. So Elevate Ukraine is not only there for the humanitarian effort, but to help build beyond that and to carry on its functions in the uh, post-war situation in assisting Ukraine to develop into a strong economy and, uh, and uh, to regenerate their social fabric. Wow, absolutely, as, as it's needed. Is there a specific area, uh, of course Ukraine and mm -hmm. all over, but any specific cities, locations where it's? That's a very good question. Uh, Elevate Ukraine has been uh, working throughout the whole country, stretching from Lviv in western Ukraine all the way to Kharkiv in eastern Ukraine. Okay. But I'd say a majority of its efforts have been in the western part of the country. Okay. Uh, so, but uh, as I mentioned, uh, the key thing is here is they've been working uh, all around the country as much right. as possible. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Um, okay. Uh, what do Ukrainians need the most right now during this difficult time? I know you mentioned several factors, mm -hmm. and but leading into that, um, how are the needs changing since since mm -hmm. the beginning of the war? Well, I think the needs are still the same as in the beginning of the war, and uh, the first need, of course, is medical right. attention. Uh, uh, like tourniquets, you know, uh, first aid kits, things of that nature. Uh, so that's very, very important uh, for people. Uh, beyond that is the issue of communications as well as the issue of uh, generation of power. Right. And that's where the generators come in very useful in this situation. So I'd say the issues have been basically the same almost from day one of the war. You have displaced people, they need medical attention, they need health care. Um, in general, overall, I would say, you know, the issues shift also with the seasons. During the, right. during the winter months, obviously, they need uh, warm clothing, mm -hmm. better shelter, things mm -hmm. of that nature. So we try to uh, meet the needs as uh, the seasons move along. But uh, the basic uh, needs are medical as well as, you know, communications and generation of electrical power. Do you feel like over time there might be some bigger changes where there, the need is going to going to shift, or it's going to become t in a different direction that you weren't expecting? Or oh, oh, it definitely will shift. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to take the long-term view. Everything I've outlined to you right now, Bailey, is the immediate needs of, of humanitarian uh, you know, requirements. Mm -hmm. uh, there will be a second stage of humanitarian requirements, and for example, uh, permanent housing is going to have to be developed right now. In addition to what I mentioned in terms of electrical power generation or you know communications or medical equipment, you need temporary housing. But then beyond that, you're going to have to develop some more permanent housing. So there's going to you're going to move into a phase of uh, reconstruction of the country, so to speak. And that's why I mentioned at the outset that Elevate Ukraine wants to uh, be able to be positioned in a way that it can help in that second stage as well. Okay, thank you so much for, for sharing that because you're absolutely right that that time will, will come at, mm -hmm. at some point. Um, is it possible to provide humanitarian aid to Ukrainians who are in Russian controlled areas? Yes, it is possible. It's difficult given the war situation, obviously, that's going on, and particularly in the actual conflict area. Um, I don't know how much other groups uh, operate in, in, the, in those areas, but Elevate Ukraine has had an ongoing relationship. Uh, we have been had situations where we've delivered stuff into the war zone area, and we also helped evacuate people from the war zone area. And even today, we have volunteers associated with Elevate Ukraine to try to carry out those two functions. Uh, so yes, we do. We are active in the war zone as much as possible, given circumstances. Wow, amazing! Thank you for sharing sure. that. Wonderful. Yeah. What's the current refugee status here, um, if, if you're aware, and are there any current refugees um, coming to Texas? Is there a limited number allowed at this time mm -hmm. in the U.S. in general? Any thoughts? Uh, that's a very good question. At the outset of the war, President Biden announced, I uh, believe, that the number of refugees that the United States would take in was 100,000. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we've met that number at this stage, but obviously there are a number of people that have taken advantage of that. 
Uh, the exact numbers in terms of state by state, I, I, I really don't know. I just know that the overall number uh, was a set at 100,000. The administration has been very forthcoming in trying to facilitate their, their travel to the United States and to provide that humanitarian uh, you know, homeland for them, or new homeland, I should say. Got it. Okay, wonderful. Um, and uh, final question here, kind of um, as a, as a wrap-up, um, how are ways that people can, can help? Well, I think it's very important, first of all, for people to be aware of the situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say there are a number of things, and I'll take a policy position here. I think it's very important for people to realize the importance of this conflict to the United States and to the free world. And it's important for them to stay engaged and make sure our representatives realize that and continue the aid to Ukraine. Uh, the second thing, of course, is people can help in one of two ways in the humanitarian side. That, of course, is to provide assistance to various nonprofits such as Elevate Ukraine or any nonprofit uh, that's operating in Ukraine. Uh, the second thing is in-kind uh, services. They can provide equipment, um, you know, uh, hospital equipment or other equipment that can be shipped to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So those are the two main avenues by which people can assist the, the efforts to help the people of Ukraine. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, well, Dr. Pabaduk, thank you so much for everything that you do. Um, I'm sure it is well received, and I know you have so much more to, to accomplish in your goals and efforts, and um, thank you so much for, well, thank you. for those efforts. Thank you for having me, Bailey. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank everyone for tuning in.